you have 43 muscles in your face. It takes all 43 of those muscles to frown, but it only takes 17 of those muscles to smile. What you probably didn't know is that just to send a signal to your muscles, an entire system of membrane proteins is needed. Without facilitated diffusion, you couldn't do either of these things. If you don't know the role that facilitated diffusion plays in biological processes, this video is for you. In this video, we are going to take a close look at the importance of channel proteins, ion channels, and aquaporins in a number of biological reactions. Plus, this stuff will definitely be on the AP test. So stick with us as we cover everything you need to know about facilitated diffusion. This video covers section 2.7 of the AP Biology curriculum that focuses on facilitated diffusion and how it is used in cells. We'll start by going over the basics of facilitated diffusion. Then we'll dive right into how carrier proteins function to carry large polar molecules across cell membranes. We'll also take a look at aquaporins and ion channels, two types of channel proteins that allow the passage of specific substances. After the quiz, We'll see how ion gradients are established, see some of their uses, and examine one of the most important proteins in your body, the sodium-potassium pump. If you only need to review one of these topics, feel free to skip to the times outlined here. Otherwise, let's get started. Let's do a quick review of facilitated diffusion, a topic we first addressed in Unit 2.6. Facilitated diffusion is a type of passive transport. Facilitated diffusion is like normal diffusion, except that it happens through special protein channels and carrier proteins. These integral membrane proteins are necessary because charged particles and large polar molecules cannot easily make their way through the plasma membrane. However, facilitated diffusion is still a form of passive transport because the molecules are moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Let's take a look at the integral membrane proteins that are necessary for facilitated diffusion. A great example of a carrier protein is glucose importing proteins. In order to keep your blood glucose levels within a specific range, your pancreas releases the hormone insulin when your blood level is high. The insulin hormone binds to a protein receptor on the surface of cells. This protein activates a sequence of events that forces a small vesicle full of glucose carrier proteins to merge with the cell membrane. This effectively adds glucose carrier proteins to the cell membrane and allows them to import glucose. Like all carrier proteins, glucose carriers operate in a specific way. First, a glucose molecule binds to the active site of the carrier protein. This changes the conformation of the protein by closing off the entrance and opening the exit to the other side of the membrane. When the protein reaches its final shape, the glucose molecule is forced out of the site and into the cell. Without glucose in the active site, the protein quickly reverts to the original shape to uptake another glucose molecule. Though gl glucose is a great example, Remember that most large polar molecules have specific carrier proteins that are needed to import or export across the cell membrane. Think about this. Diabetes is a disease that causes high blood sugar levels. Essentially, diabetes is caused when your body cannot effectively activate the processes of facilitated diffusion. Type 1 diabetes is caused when your body cannot produce the hormone insulin, while type 2 diabetes is caused when your body cannot utilize insulin efficiently. High blood glucose levels can lead to damage in the eyes, kidneys, and nervous system. Patients with diabetes must regularly measure their blood glucose levels and take shots of insulin as needed. This helps reactivate the glucose carriers in cells and lowers the glucose concentration in the blood. Since water is a small polar molecule, it is partially blocked by the plasma membrane. Though small amounts of water can slip through the lipid bilayer, many organisms have a requirement to transfer water much faster between cells. Consider this plant for example. The plant must uptake large amounts of water through tiny root hairs. This water not only carries nutrients to the leaves, but it is also crucial for the process of photosynthesis. If the plant had to rely on water passing through the cell membrane via osmosis, there is no way it could gather enough water to provide for all its leaves and stems. This is where aquaporins come in. 
Aquaporins are a type of channel protein that are specific to water. When an aquaporin is open, water can freely flow through the hollow center of the protein at a much faster rate than it can travel through the cell membrane. Plus, the aquaporin has a number of amino acids exposed on the inside of the tube that create a series of charged surfaces to actively select for water molecules. Water molecules can pass easily, but if an ion or large molecule tries to enter the aquaporin, it will be quickly rejected. These aquaporins are present in plants, animals, fungi, and even bacterial cells to allow for a fast passage of water in various cell types. Similar to how aquaporins only allow water through, there are a large number of ion channels that only allow specific ions through the cell membrane. There are several different types of ion channels that allow for facilitated diffusion of different ions under different conditions. Some ion channels are always open. These channels allow for the passage of ions in either direction all the time. Typically, this form of ion channel is used when a concentration gradient needs to be constantly relieved due to the buildup of ions from biochemical reactions elsewhere in the cell. Some ion channels are ligand gated. A ligand is a molecule that can bind to a receptor, and neurotransmitters are a good example. Ligand gated ion channels are present on neurons. When a neurotransmitter binds to the channel, it immediately opens. This releases a flood of ions into the cell, changing the electrical gradient and polarizing the cell membrane. This creates an electrical signal which can flow through the cell. Further on down the nerve cell are voltage gated ion channels. When the electrical impulse travels down the nerve and hits these channels, they open. This flow of ions reestablishes the electrical signal and keeps it traveling down the cell membrane. Certain ion channels can also be activated mechanically. For example, hairs in your inner ear wiggle when they are hit by sound waves and move nearby nerve cells. This mechanical motion opens up mechanically gated ion channels, creating a nervous signal which travels to your brain. Your brain interprets this signal as a sound, which is essentially how hearing works. Now that we have covered ion channels, aquaporins, and carrier proteins, let's see if you can remember what we talked about. Pause the video now and answer the following questions. You can find answers to these questions through the quick test prep link in this video's description. We've seen how facilitated diffusion can alleviate a concentration gradient. So that begs the question, how are these concentration gradients created to begin with? The answer is active transport. For example, consider the enzyme that creates ATP, ATP synthase. ATP synthase relies on a gradient of hydrogen ions to operate and create new ATP molecules. ATP synthase is essentially extracting energy from this hydrogen ion gradient by allowing the facilitated diffusion of hydrogen ions. As the molecules pass back through ATP synthase, the protein turns and catalyzes the formation of new ATP molecules. This gradient is built by three other molecules that are actively pumping hydrogen ions to one side of the membrane. We'll cover this specific system further in a future section, though it should be noted that these active transport systems can be powered in different ways. For instance, electron carriers like NADH can give energy to the protein, allowing it to pump hydrogen ions against their gradient. Other proteins rely on the energy they can extract from passing electrons, while still others rely on the excess energy given off by the formation of water molecules. Together, these proteins are constantly restocking the hydrogen ion gradient so that ATP synthase can function. As we'll see in a minute, your brain needs a lot of energy to function. Now's a good time to take a short break, search for a quick snack, and grab some water. When we come back, we'll look at the sodium potassium ATPase, probably one of the most important proteins in your body. The sodium potassium ATPase, or sodium potassium pump, is one of the most important proteins in your cells because it carries out several important tasks. First off, it establishes a resting membrane potential on your nerve and muscle cells. This slight electrical charge is caused by the export of three positive charges on sodium ions, 
with the corresponding import of two positively charged potassium ions. So, with every cycle of the sodium potassium pump, there is a net of one positive charge added to the outside of the cell. This creates an electrical potential across the cell membrane. Nerves use this resting electrical potential to quickly send signals. At the start of a neuron, ligand-gated sodium channels are opened when a neurotransmitter binds to them. This causes a massive influx of sodium ions back into the cell. The influx creates an action potential as the membrane becomes depolarized. This change in voltage quickly opens voltage-gated sodium channels all along the neuron, sending the electrical signal down the length of the neuron cell membrane. Then, the cell must repolarize the cell membrane in order to prepare for the next signal. Potassium ion channels are opened, slightly repolarizing the membrane. The sodium-potassium ATPase finishes the process by using ATP to pump all of the sodium out and all of the potassium back in, re-establishing the resting electrical potential. This is an extremely energy demanding process using up to 75% of the total ATP a nerve cell makes. However, this sodium potassium pump is not only found in nerve cells. It also helps regulate the ion balance in almost every cell of your body and the ion gradients this protein can make are used in many, many cellular processes that use secondary active transport to move different substances against their gradients. Now that we have covered how ion gradients are established and some of the different ways that cells can utilize these gradients, let's see if you can answer some AP style questions. Pause the video now and answer the following questions. You can find answers to all of the questions in this video through the quick test prep link in this video's description, as well as a number of other helpful resources that will help you study for the AP test. Thanks for watching. Please like this video if it was helpful and informative. Leave us any comments or questions you have about facilitated diffusion or ion gradients, and subscribe to the Biology Dictionary channel to find all of our AP Biology videos and helpful resources. Good luck!